I'm very pleased, of course, to introduce uh, uh, Toshio Magui's work, uh, biography, um, his uh, lecture tonight at, at Paris. So Toshi is a Japanese typeface designer. He's based in London, um, and he um, uh, he's, uh, he, he has a diploma. Um, of the visual communication design course at the University uh, in Tokyo that he, uh, what he has in uh, 2008. And then he did an AMA uh, typeface design program that we know very well here at the University of, of Reading in 2011. Um, he worked for Monotype uh, from 2012 to 2020. And he worked with Nadine, that we will see afterwards. There are quite many connections between uh, both of them, I think. Um, uh, and he, he's very interested. Um, in 2020, when he stopped working for Monotype, uh, he created his own studio that he runs in uh, London. Uh, he's very uh, in, interested and inspired by the old game fonts, and uh, he has started in 2009 uh, Fabula Type Foundry uh, that releases uh, monospace typefaces only. <coughs> so he decided to create another uh, foundry that is called OTF. Guess what? <laughs> Doesn't mean what you think. <laughs> um, uh, it could be um, Omagari Toshi Foundry, but it's not. So this uh, sec um, second uh, foundry is called Omega Tai Foundry and is dedicated to non monospace fonts. Um, uh, and what I think is interesting with his work is that he doesn't design uh, uh, Japanese typefaces. That's what we were. Not yet. We were <laughs> saying that he, he should be. We really <coughs> um, Of course, he gives lectures and has uh, many. Um, uh, um, ah. Uh, recognitions and prizes and uh, in many. Um, uh, Awards, merci beaucoup. Uh, I have to say that he published a very a great book called Arcade Game Typography, the Art of Fix and Type in 2009, uh, published by, by Times and Hudson. And I want to mention the great uh, interview uh, Q&A that you can read on uh, Typepers uh, websites and Gina, uh, that Gina uh, uh, did very interesting about the design process and everything, so please go and check uh, this. We have to talk about uh, something afterwards. It's this shrimps keeping interest you have. <laughs> so let's talk about it uh, <laughs> later, please. Please welcome. <laughs> Hello everyone, I'm Toshi Omagai, and uh, for the introduction, I, yeah, I'm from Japan, graduated uh, from Tokyo, and I'm ready to uh, spend most of my career in Monotype uh, so far. Spent a uh, lot of time designing Latin and Monotype in uh, typefaces, uh, fictional or real, it doesn't matter. So today I'm going to talk about uh, just random things that I've done in the past. Some of them are typefaces, of course, some of them not. And I'm roughly going to talk about uh, them in chronological order. So I'll start with uh, Reading. And at Reading, I, I was not like, super new to typeface design, and I, I had you know, studied a bit about the history of that alphabet. And what interested me the most uh, at the time was this uh, Italian Renaissance uh, metaphors calligraphy and uh, typographic forms. This is the time when Roman typeface were being made. 
and there are uh, people still experimenting in the forms, and there are lots of really nice energy uh, in the letter forms. So I wanted to do something like that, uh, make a uh, Roman that you know I was still starting starting to form. So I will cut the story very short, but uh, this is uh, the basic design I ended up with, and my stem structure is like this. It's uh, the, well, the capital stems are written uh, in one stroke, basically. So it's uh, bracketed on the left hand side and it's uh, on the right because it's you know, going this way. And the whole uh, Latin alphabet looks like this. So there's no straight stem. Everything is a bit slanted and wants to move to the right. So that's the kind of energy I wanted to make. <coughs> and yeah, and it's, I don't know where it's uh, being used at the moment. I know one example of a, uh, it's not a good image, but this is a Mexican publisher who uh, uses Marco, uh, this typeface a lot, so it's great. I have made uh, Latin, Greek, Cyrillic, and the most interesting, the Mongolian. Mongolia uh, uses this uh, vertical text, you read it from this side, to the, from the right side. Uh, no, from the left side, sorry. And Japanese, Chinese, Korean, they start from the uh, right hand side, so uh, it's actually probably the only vertical script that, uh, script that starts from this side. And he was originally like Arabic, he was based on Syriac script, so everything was a right to left horizontal script, but they decided to rotate everything. So if you think about Arabic, Arabic is right to left, and if you well, with the whole thing counterclockwise, you get the uh, Mongolian direction. So, my Mongolian uh, looks like this. It's a, I don't know, it's semi calligraphic like uh, Latin. And this uh, work of Mongolian uh, came into use right after uh, joining Monotai. I designed a Noto Sans Mongolian. So at the time, we were using uh, font lab. So the hard thing about um, designing a Mongolian script is that internally speaking, it's treated as a horizontal script. But so you need to uh, design a vertical script this way, which means this. <laughs> <laughs> what <Or> is this? <laughs> and during reading, I ended up doing this, which is really bad for your hard drive. But, yeah. But uh, after joining Monotype, the company bought me a vertical uh, oh, sorry, a display that can rotate vertically. So I needed to hold the mouse vertically, uh, rotated, so it is still really hard. But yeah, and you have a lot of science Mongolian. So no uh, typeface project I have done uh, it includes like five, six different Noto science scripts. So Mongolian is one of them. Uh, this is uh, like a medieval Mongolian, uh, Mongolian uh, writing style. One of the one of my favorite writing styles. It's really cool. And I also done North Sans Tibetan. So for each project, I buy tons of books. I I speak to local people if possible. Sometimes go, uh, go to the place like Mongolia, and yeah, and do some calligraphy a lot. So. Until I start each project, I'm not expert in uh, these, but I try my best to be one. But you know, learning to speak, uh, for example, the Tibetan language, I don't actually know how to say hello in Tibetan. Probably I should. Uh, but you're learning how to write, how to you know make a nice visual pattern of uh, Tibetan or uh, Mongolian. And there's not much overlap. But we are designers. We we're supposed to be good at. Uh, making visual pattern, so that's that's what your uh, your focus will be. <clears throat> and another major thing that Monotype I uh, was doing uh, is lots of typeface revivals. Because there are lots of really really nice uh, classic typefaces of Monotype and also Linotype that could be uh, so much nicer, but uh, aren't for different reasons. Uh, one. It's called Metronoma. Metro is a typeface that was originally made in 
30 by an American typeface designer called uh, William Alexander Wiggins. He also used to make uh, puppets or marionettes. He's also uh, often called uh, to be the first person who said that I'm a graphic designer, which yeah, you know, is kind of disputed, but it's yeah, usually attributed to this guy, the word uh, term graphic designer. And he designed a typeface called Metro. This is a digital Metro uh, before my revival. And the typeface we have was something called Metro number no. two. Also, Metro was weird because we had a uh, style name after the family. So Metro light, like Metro medium, Metro black, even all in one word. So now it's even called Metro two medium, but at the time it was different. Anyway, for a long time we had this Metro two, but we didn't know what Metro one was. So in digital form, people like people say they like Metro, but this is actually the second form. And we discovered the first form of Metro, which was more, uh, one above. So in 29. And it's more like a humanistic design, and it's more calligraphic. The E is, I don't know, it's having fun. It's really nice shape. And Lionel the company, didn't have Futura back then, but Futura was becoming really popular. So basically, asked, they asked uh, Dwayne to make something like Futura. So they took the easy way, just modified a few letter forms. Um, metro number two became the Metro. Uh, metro one was uh, forgotten. So that's something I wanted to revive, the more fun version of Metro. And uh, of course, it comes with more weights. Uh, the Metro number two design was still available in the stylish set, so you could have both, or you could actually mix them. So that's the first uh, revival I did. Um, another revival that I was really fond of is uh, Bertolt Volpe uh, collection. Bertolt Volpe was a Jewish uh, designer living in uh, Frankfurt, or near Frankfurt. And he was uh, like he was Jewish, so he uh, escaped uh, from Germany to UK in 1933 uh, to basically escape the Nazi regime. And his career uh, flourished in UK as a, a graphic designer. Uh, they uh, he usually designed the book covers, but he also designed uh, typefaces. Uh, the most famous one was Agathos. Uh, Albertus is everywhere. It's uh, in, mostly in like, Britain. Uh, used on screen a lot. Uh, one famous use is uh, the, the, the David Lynch one, the more interesting one. <laughs> no, no, I like the uh, original Dune. Actually, the sound, soundtrack is better than Hans Zimmer one. And also, it's in the uh, one dollar coin of the United States. So, if you're American, you have it in your wallet. And Albertus wasn't really nicely designed if you pay attention to the details. My, my nemesis is the slow case G. Like, really, the light version. <laughs> we were selling this like this. And um, yeah, so I have this uh, original G that was kind of cut on the bottom left. Uh, it was designed like this purely because of the mechanical reason. And the original drawing looked more like this on the on the right, so I wanted to uh, make it nicer. And the other slide was even worse. Yeah. So I, I wanted uh, something a bit cleaner. Um, another my problem with Albertus uh, that I had was that Albertus was released in OCAP first, then Logis was added later. So stylistically, it looks quite different. And Pedro Bobe was a uh, German, Jewish German. So he made Albertus as a kind of Roman capital design, but his Logis was, okay, this is his initial design. He was really making fractal designs. That's why you have this stylistic clash of application and low case. And the low case was lighter, much tightly spaced, and yeah, for me it wasn't really working well. So that's something I wanted to improve. Uh, if you have a very close look, 
the stems are a little thicker in Nova, and the spacing is a little wider uh, in Nova as well. So it's really subtle, but I think it works better with the capitals now. So yeah, that's what I did. And yeah, about this Nova has uh, five waves now, and with Greek and city. And during the era of VHS, like in the 70s, 80s, and 60s, Albertus was really popular on screen in TV shows and films. And I think Albertus is becoming really popular again, like for example, uh, Mortal Kombat, that's a video game, and you see the Russian uh, on screen. And the Albertus before had only Latin, so this kind of use was not possible. And also, Disney seems to be like Albertus Nova, so yeah, I'm seeing a lot of that. Makes me really happy. And Belt of Bombay Collection is a, a set of five typefaces, and only one Albertus was previously on sale. But each one has a really interesting story. Actually, my favorite is Pegasus. If you pay attention to the Pegasus, the, actually, each serif is different, and the P and D and B Q are totally different to each other, and there's so many bonkers things happening in the Pegasus. But when you actually see the text uh, in Pegasus, it reads fine. So it's a quite interesting typeface to observe. Kind of, you know, challenges the notion of consistency. It questions whether consistency consistency is that important. And when it comes to the French use, uh, the edition B forty two or I don't know how to say forty two in French, but anyway, they're using the uh, Belfort uh, collection a lot. So you see the big uh, fanfare typeface. Also, the smaller Roman is uh, Pegasus. I also love that they, they seem to uh, modify the acute shape every time. So you see the acute in Musée is different from the Louis here. So that's something, yeah, they do all the time. Um, briefly talking about something not typefaces. Um, one of the things I you know, try to do a lot is combining my passion of uh, games, of playing in general, with the type, uh, typography. So in 2013-14, I started uh, Rubik's Cube. So, you know, I, I used to carry to conferences and, you know, friends' dreams all the time, and one friend suggested that I should make something typographic. So then I started thinking, oh, what is the best thing, uh, best typographic thing that's cubic and uh, put on Rubik's Cube? And after a while, I thought, oh, I, I think the answer is rather obvious. Uh, if you don't know, this is a uh, 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 mental picture of a uh, three-axis interpolation uh, by Perry Nonsa. I think it was in like the 80s. I don't remember exactly when. And it was a really revolutionary idea. Like, the letter forms can be this flexible, although it doesn't really work outside the log AC. Like, if you think about N, and it's already not going to work very well. Anyway, so I decided to buy a white cube, remove all the stickers, and print it on my own stickers to make this. Each each cell is unique, so you can solve it. For me, it takes like uh, 15, 20 minutes. And while this looks beautiful, uh, it looks even more beautiful when it's scrambled like this. <laughs> So it's, it's crazy, right? <coughs> So yeah. And so this is not the whole picture. Uh, in 2013, David Jonathan Ross, uh, American type designer, he proposed that you have contrast axis, but you know you can move beyond the sunset and start exploring the horizontal version of it. So. Yeah, in his presentation on, of um, horizontal stress typefaces, he proposed this alternate universe of uh, uh, nodes IQ. So I decided to make another IQ, but more than that, I decided to combine them. <laughs> this is a special IQ that I ordered uh, from uh, actually a French uh, product designer. 
and it costs like 500 euros. <laughs> um, it, this being a long rectangle uh, shape, when it scrambles, it's going to look like this. <laughs> yeah. But I, yeah, I could never solve this cube actually. <laughs> um, yeah. Another uh, combination of fun and type for plane and type is cleaning controller. I play video games a lot, so I'm more comfortable with like a kind of gaming hardware. So, for example, in my typeface design, I just don't use keyboard. I use uh, this kind of special gaming keypad and assign all these keyboard shortcuts. So, so that I don't have to press like four different keys in weird positions every time. So it's much faster. And um, for curling, I used to have a dedicated uh, controller, uh, Xbox controller. I mean, because if you use it worse, if you want to curl by 10 units, you need to press four keys. That's, that's too much. I just want to do it in one. So, yeah, this has been my, yeah, this is how I use it. So. But this method stopped, stopped working because the, there was a really nice uh, driver software uh, and it's supporting, uh, yeah, and I had to make, make a, uh, find a new way. And my new way was to completely customize. So I, I bought all these parts, it was like 30 euros, it was quite cheap. And started uh, making from a plate of a graded sheet. And put some vinyl and uh, caps, hand wired everything like this. And the bottom case is uh, it's, it's 3D printed by, by, by hand using 3D pen. <laughs> I didn't, yeah, I didn't go for the 3D printing route, well, by, by hand. And spent a lot of time finishing to look more or less acceptable, so it looks like this now. So the, the shortcut looks like this, basically. So yeah, people talk about, you know, the keyboard shortcuts and stuff, but I always advocate for, you know, explore new uh, different hardwares, and that might be more comfortable for you or pen tablet, but for mouse driver, so, you know, you don't have to stick to the trackpad and keyboard. And this is my usual kerning methods, but I also wanted to make more automatic methods as well, so that's my next topic, bubble kern. Have you, have any of you heard of bubble kern? Yes, yes. Oh, that's, that's my minority, that's great. Okay, so, kerning is, something you have to do to letter space. And there are two ideas of letter spacing. One is tracking. Tracking is something you add or remove to every gap between letters. This is not curling. Some people might call it curling, but it's not. Curling is something you do to specific letter uh, pairs, for example, B and A, or A and B. Sometimes not A. And currents used to refer to these bits that is sticking out, the bit that is burning. <laughs> that, that, that used to be called current. So that's where the term comes from. And in hot metal, like monotype, uh, you have this kind of uh, shape. This is typically the same in metallic. You have another E or like this, and it's supposed to, you know, get them uh, close uh, like this. So the body shape was uh, rectangle at the bottom, but wasn't really at the top, the surface level, the face level, like this. And if you look at the uh, uh, wood type, you sometimes see printers actually, you know, hacking their way to, you know, get the spacing closer, although I think he, yeah, this one cuts too much of the A. So that, that's the kind of uh, cutting that people are doing you know, to have non-rectangle shape, non-square shape. And then precedence in uh, digital as well. This is a very early uh, type design uh, software called Columns for Atari ST hardware. And it had this uh, intelligent kerning system with staircase kerning. And it had like five, uh, no, eight different bands. And this was your, uh, side, not side bearings, but uh, body. And another example is Microsoft's mathematical coding. Uh, they 
Because mathematical type changing involves a lot of different size letter, not mean, but lots of different vertical positions. So they needed to have something more automatic. And they came up with this uh, irregular shaped uh, bodies. So seeing all of that, I decided, OK, I could probably make something like that to automate curving. So my approach in Bubblegum is to draw this violet uh, shape or space around Level. That's what I'm called bubble, uh, calling bubble. Once you have this basic curve around the letter, you have the script analyzing you know, the distance from the uh, side bearings. And you have another letter. And based on this uh, calculation, bubble can, you know, finds the closest distance. And that's going to be your curling value. So I have this as a, a list uh, plugin. I'm not saying this is necessarily faster, but I think when you use it, it would probably become faster. But it really makes you think about the spacing approach, like what is spacing. So I think it has more educational value. So it's a, it's a really fun way to you know, explore the type of design. But I am also very interested in uh, the world without curling. <laughs> so how they paint typography. I grew up in Japan when arcade games were huge, like this. You know, when you're like 12 or 15 years old, with some uh, pocket change, you go to an arcade game, uh, gaming arcades, just playing, yeah, in the evenings, in the weekends, and, you know, used to see this kind of uh, graphics all the time. And it had really, really nice better forms, usually more space. And, in 2017, 18, I decided to gather everything. Um, every, uh, play every arcade game, and you know, there were like 7,000 different arcade games. I went through all of them. And yeah, started collecting uh, these letter forms. They are all 8 pixels, mono spaced, but if you pay attention to the pixel count, each letter actually occupies 7 pixels. One pixel is reserved for space. And yeah, this is one of the earliest uh, gaming typefaces, the Atari typeface, uh, also known as the Pac Man typeface, because Namco used a lot uh, in Pac Man. And what's fun about uh, video game fonts is that they will use colors a lot. So. <laughs> This is still like a kind of low, it only has two colors, but if you look at the uh, video game fonts from PlayStation era, the, you will sometimes see like 21 different colors in one letter font. But, you know, this format has only 64 pixels, and you're using 20, 21 colors, like, <laughs> that's, yeah, that's crazy, but that's the world they were uh, living. And there were no professional typographers, they, they were just random graphic people from the departments. They didn't know what to do, and they were just trying to make something. So there were lots of really crazy ideas coming from non-professionals. So that's also really fun. Uh, like this A and Q and R. And yeah, these are this the kind of decisions that um, I, as a professional type designer, wouldn't make, but find it really interesting. <coughs> And this one, uh, I think this one has like 10 different colors. Uh, I don't know. And it's a combination of uh, MICR uh, capitals, like uh, Data 70, and that's much with the cursive lowercase. Like, uh, why would you do that? You know, it, it's crazy, but it works. Yeah, because why not? You know. And another is. Uh, um, these are all made by Japanese people, so Latin was not their native. That's another way of not knowing what to do. So they were making crazy decisions. If you noticed, the G always sits on the D center, uh, sorry, baseline. They didn't really understand B centers. So going back, you see the G sits on the uh, baseline. Y sits on the baseline as well. Just they just didn't like that. So this is a kind of stuff you see. <coughs> Uh, Japanese uh, video game fonts, but I find it really fun. 
So I can't think it's, uh, about 300 of them um, published it as a book. So if you think about how many games I played, you're talking about like maybe two to five percent of my actual collection. <laughs> it's actually much. Yeah, there's so much you're missing, but yeah. Okay. Anyway, um, inspired by all these uh, more space letter forms, I decided to you know open a new foundry that's exclusively mono space which I call tablet type foundry. The launching typefaces were not terribly, uh, I don't know, video game inspired or anything. So this is, let me see, this cube, uh, the cube at the top left comes from a video game uh, letter font. Another is tablet amore. It's a combination of tablet and Italian amore, the uh, love. So you see, you know, you see this kind of script all the time. And I thought, Okay, this could be actually more space. So that's what I did. And the next one I did turned out to be uh, my best saving typeface for, I don't, know, I don't know if I should be happy or not. Uh, that's a more space comic sand. <laughs> so I discovered people who enjoy coding or programming in comic sand. And I, I get the idea, but well, comic sand looks really nice on screen. There's some, lots of issues. Uh, there are absolutely yeah, problems, but I understand why they are popular. And I love comic sans. <laughs> I, I genuinely do. So I, I understand the hate, but I also don't. <laughs> I don't know. Um, but in my monospace version, for example, this is the kind of fixes that I did. I like the general shape, but I don't like the, this wonky curve. So make, make it a little cleaner. And of course, this is a monospace uh, for small text. So I needed to make, for example, lowercase a uh, to story, uppercase y. That probably doesn't work for, you know, because it could look like a lowercase y. So this is some kind of changes that I made. So this is comic sound, this is comic code. It takes a general idea of comic sounds, but, you know, it's roughly the same as Comic Sans, but uh, quite different in detail. So, and it's like this, it's, yeah, looks like this. Okay, yeah. um, another type is, this one is more serious, although still casual. Um, I really liked uh, how, you know, typefaces or letter forms look like on CRT displays. They're usually fuzzy and soft and round. I wanted uh, this kind of aesthetics. Also, I also like, you can tell from this, uh, I really like round shapes nowadays. So I also love uh, yeah, uh, ice works and pretzels. So this is like another inspiration. More and more on the CRT display. So this is a typeface that I uh, made called Codinia. I also wanted to make the programming look less scary because all this. I, I don't know, input or uh, input is a great typeface, but also uh, Mona, Monaco from Apple. They all look like a really strong sans serif. And I wanted something more casual, uh, something more approachable. And yeah, this is the Roman, and this is Italic. So the Italic the A and G they look kind of like a pretzel shape, so they don't necessarily look calligraphic you know, how the breaks are casually introduced in the middle. So that's the idea. And maybe the Cordelia is actually a combination of Cordelia from uh, the Shakespeare uh, King Lear and Code. If you combine them, you get Cordelia without R. And this is a kind of naming uh, style I really enjoy. You know, people say that they struggle with uh, new uh, great typeface names. For me, not so much, because you can just combine them. Like, red tabular mode, tabular mode, it is tabular mode. And that's coming from, you know, Pokemon. The lots of Pokemon actually uh, from, combined with two different things. So what I'm saying is typeface designers should play Pokemon more. Because <laughs> why don't you come up with a new, new name? That's automatically going to be new. So, well, hopefully. 
So yeah, that would be my advice. <coughs> and because at some point I would get tired of making one space all the time, so decided to set up my uh, uh, new foundry, Omega Type Foundry. Sounds sounds a bit like my surname, so that's why I have to make it. So yeah, I have TTF and OTF. The tablet type foundry and Omega Type Foundry. And I will just talk about uh, this one project uh, called Placket, and that will be the end of my talk. Uh, this one is a Arabic typeface, and you know there are six major scripts uh, in Arabic that's on many different texts. But there are lots of other styles as well. And usually, when you talk about uh, Arabic typefaces in typography, people take uh, Nasp or Kufi letter forms. And styles like uh, Rupa, Divani, Nasari are really hard to adapt to uh, typographic forms because they're all slanted and cascading. But it is really popular. Uh, this, this is a picture from Egypt. People write this stuff all the time. And I was really inspired by this. And this is another one. So yeah, I decided to do the Rupa. And there are lots of Instagram type, type of uh, calligraphers there uh, flexing their muscles. And yeah, it's really easy to, easy to collect uh, letter form samples nowadays, like this. And Ruka in Egypt, especially, was really popular in the film posters. Uh, Egyptian films are posters are amazing. There are lots of really nice Ruka uh, samples, like this. Uh, oh, this Arabic is, by the way. Uh, Latino sounds Arabic. <laughs> um, another like sci-fi Ruka, uh, it's great. And this one is more like a sans serif Ruka uh, at the bottom. And all these styles uh, can be found in there are a few books like this, but now uh, one I would recommend is uh, this uh, part of the Egyptian film process. It's kind of hard to get outside uh, the Middle East, but you should look for one. So, inspired by this, I started making a uh, uh, Ruka typeface. This is my version 1. I will skip the whole uh, part in the middle, but this is my final design. So, it's a bit more rounded, it's less steep, and it's much thicker and punchier. And I spent, like, I don't know, four years maybe, with the help of uh, people like Nadine or uh, former colleagues at one type. <coughs> So I was really fortunate to have Nadine basically next to me. <laughs> you know. And I started with Arabic first. It's a really uh, not a common thing when we have multi script typeface. You normally start with Latin, but I really want to, you know, when, when you have this kind of project, I really want to encourage people to start with non Latin first. For example, in my case, Arabic. Uh, there are lots of, you know, Decisions that I made in Arabic first and started thinking, oh, what can I do uh, with Latin? So, you might want to make a sans serif, but I decided to go with the slab serif. That way I can show the slant more. If it's, if it's sans serif, then the horizontal movement is smaller. So, there's a, like a similar kind of angle. And I also decided to make just casually cut off the serif. Is there an Oscar serif? Where is my mouse? Where's my mouse? Nah, whatever. Ah, it disappears. If you look at the capital H, the capital H doesn't have all the circles. It kind of chops off if the spacing is too much. So it's a uh, display face that just does whatever, whatever it pleases. So in combination, then look like this. So. Uh, if I didn't start with uh, Arabic, I probably wouldn't end up with this uh, uh, form of Latin. So, <clears throat> yeah, that would be my uh, suggestion. If you have multi script space, sometimes you start with other scripts. That might not be more, more fun. So, yeah, uh, I think that's, that's the end of the talk. Thank you very much.
Can you hear me? Merci beaucoup. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Great lecture. Um, just one thing. Um, um, I think you 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 don't. Do you speak all the languages of the Dutch faces? You you. No, just just Japanese and English and yeah. Python. Sure. Yeah. So it's, <laughs> it's it's really amazing. I think. Because it's it's so fresh and so interesting to see that you're taking decisions that are mostly um, connected to the confidence you can have in your eye, or it's really a design process that is disconnected to the languages yeah. uh, thing uh, uh, processes. And I think it's very interesting because I feel that in the typeface uh, design world you must <coughs> exactly do the opposite, I think. So how do you, because you're also, uh, you, you've been at, at uh, Reading. Yeah. So it's, it's nice to see that maybe you learn things there. Mm -hmm. And now that you're professional, you're doing things on your own. Maybe you're much more free, mm -hmm. and uh, so you make uh, your own decisions. But how can you do that? How do you manage, or do you have the consciousness? Or uh, I'm not sure if I'm managing my you know time and commitment well enough. Like I, I used to work at the monotype, and then things were easier. You know, I just doing what I was uh, told. Uh, I don't know if I'm answering the question. Uh, it's the research. Like it's the research. Yeah, yeah, yeah. How do you go about understanding the scripts? Like, what do you do for errors? Uh, I buy lots of books for each script, each new script. I, I, I buy at least 10 books on calligraphy. I might buy a dictionary. I might buy uh, design books. And I, of course, uh, speak to native speakers as much as possible. I try to find, I don't know, uh, Calligraphers, just any anyone related to letter uh, lettering, and the research uh, takes maybe sixty percent, seventy percent of my actual time of in each project. So yeah, there's no short uh, shortcuts that I can make. I just spend a lot of time because I didn't grow up with any of the uh, scripts, I'm, but I need to you know fast forward the process. So I do calligraphy as well. So yeah, sure. Yeah. That in the end, yeah. you take decisions, yeah. and you said maybe a typeface designer wouldn't have done things like that. Mm. So it's yeah, I think it's interesting the yeah, freedom you have. Yeah, you know it. You do it, but it's interesting. Mm -hmm. so maybe you have questions. Thank you, Tashi, for the, this is the impressive lecture. I'm a big fan of yours. I, I have some of your typeface. Oh, thank you. And um, as you are uh, very conscious about the video games and yeah. how immersive they are, uh, how do you see um, how uh, typeface uh, could be used for uh, this immersive world? such as video games and now the metaverse and this kind of, of uh, world when the ad addictive, uh, an, ad an addictive context with the funny uh, letters and sometimes serious, uh, serious use of, uh, of uh, and the problem of legibility. How do you see that? Yeah. Uh, so stylistically speaking, there could be lots you could do at the moment. If you think about modern fonts technology, they don't, uh, gaming companies, they don't use variable fonts, they don't use color fonts. In my opinion, they should be to totally doing it. And they also don't spend enough time on the visibility front. I mean, they're getting, uh, they're getting much better than, say, three or five years ago. And so, <coughs> the visibility was, it, it, they're going in a great direction. Stylistically, they could be doing a lot, lot better. So, and also, if you think about, like, Games that take place in Japan. There, if you walk walk in the uh, Tokyo street, uh, all these uh, game graphics made by I don't know 
American, French companies, whatever, they usually have terrible science. So they don't do enough research actually uh, when creating gaming environments. So that's the kind of things that I might, you know, uh, find a job. Like there's no typography consultants uh, in gaming industry. Yeah, you could you could be one. <laughs> Thank you very much for praising and fun. Uh, I wonder why you're not speaking about your latest projects, the Platia or Platia, yeah. Platia font that you're using for the, your titles. Yeah. And uh, why, why? And could you please tell us about it? Well, I cut off like half of my work done, so it could be. Uh, yeah, Platia. If you want to know about the state. From a very classical of Victorian data forms, um, they back in the day they were called Hellenic white, Hellenic being uh, Greek, but it's basically like a stretched version of Scotch Roman uh, with more more linear uh, stroke. So I wanted to make something nicer. Oh, what's the best way to show it to you? I just need to bring up the uh, font explorer. That's probably the easiest way. Oh, it's my master, so something like this. Go online, I'm sorry? Go online, yeah. Or I could just, uh, just being lazy. Oh, Platy is not here, okay. Anyway, um, if you look at like 19th century typography, especially from yeah, France and Germany and Britain, you see lots of this kind of style. And I looked at uh, all the uh, available uh, typefaces online. Every one, uh, every single one of them. Oh, sorry, I should I shouldn't say that. But there were really uh, old designs, really, uh, like from 19th century. There are also really nice modern designs like that. Uh, FF Zapata by uh, Eric Van Portland and Film of Life Hands. Those were too modern for me. So I wanted something that's in the middle. Like it looks clean and modern, but still looks classical enough. And yeah, I can talk about this, of course, totally. And there are things I've done for spacing. For example, I just want A. The, the A in uh, Hellenic white has a very long serif, and it creates huge gap yeah, when you typeset actual text. So I decided to introduce alternate forms. So if I have A and H next to each other, you see the space actually, or the serif length actually, is modified. So shaping is spacing. So for me, they're the same thing. You're making shape to do the spacing. So. I have QU. QU is the same story. The self uh, actually changes in the detail level. Why well, as well? So, so yeah, that's a kind of uh, thing, uh, detail I like about this type is. But yeah, and he has a Greek and Cyrillic for the first time. So Greek is like this, and Cyrillic was uh, relatively easy. Compared to the Greek, I had less headache, but yeah, like this. Should that be okay? Like this? Yeah. First of all, I really enjoy your presentation. My question is like, when you're doing revival, like overflow or redesigning my comic code, how do you keep balance between like something to discard it, something discarded from the original, original one and you know, not like such, because this can be like a permanent feature. Mm -hmm. So how do you keep balance between like what to keep and what to start? Right. I generally want to make them as authentic as possible, but usually, <coughs> you know, these uh, typefaces that people love have problems. Like sometimes obvious problems, sometimes uh, the stuff that on the IC has a problem. But you want to, uh, I, I want to fix them. But without actually, uh, without actually destroying what people like about, uh, for example, about this. 
why you always say is that probably the typeface, uh, the cluster typeface, is only beautiful in your head. And if you actually see it, it's not as beautiful. And my job is to basically create, you know, the beautiful version in your head, right? And that might be different from person to person. If you give the same project to ten different designers, you might have ten different revivals. That's that's what makes revivals uh, fun. And I don't, I, I try not to put myself into the revivals because the personality is something that's inevitable. It, it's always in your design. So. I'm not worried about you know having to put myself in there. It's always there, so I, that's something I, I try to suppress, but ends up in the typeface anyway. So that's that's my view of personality in at least in revival. It's not a good question, sir. Um, I would be curious to see your own version of the papyrus font. <laughs> you are um, my way understanding now. <laughs> I have the papyrus. Okay, first of all, I don't understand why people hate papyrus. And for me, it's already good enough, so I don't know why else to fix. So. Why do people hate papyrus? I don't get it. So uh, a remark in the same time. Yeah. Um, I did have, uh, because of your presentation, I'm able to understand your to feel a certain way to approach my design. Mm. Uh, I never realized that before. Um, but the way I, I know some of most of your work separately, mm. but when we look at it uh, together, um, uh, you are a funny guy. I mean. Uh, <laughs> It's a compliment what I'm saying, but uh, yeah, because um, I wanted to, to understand a little bit more about that story of to have it fun. Yeah, you know, <coughs> there is some type, type designer who do some very strict, super regular, flat, maybe boring for some other, but they have so much fun doing that, hmm. and it seems to be super obscure, um, rigid words that. It's not very pleasant to the eye, but it's super fun to do it. Yeah. But you, uh, you, you seem to have a lot of fun doing things. You, you have joke all the time, uh, super narrow private joke about what, what are you doing, a super subtle joke about things. But everything you do, it seems you want to have some playful letter form. Even with the last question, Papyrus, Pelixon, or some other, mm -hmm. you like when it's more. Yes, more fun. Yeah. Do you think that typography is is not fun at all? So you want to to bring to typography something more colorful, or because the language is boring? Yes. Why? What is the idea you have behind that? Well, I make very serious typefaces as well, but I always want to have fun in work, like like a gaming controller. That's one way, and more fun letter forms. But I. I think I have a very short attention span, like, I don't know, so I cannot, I cannot work like a, you know, refrigerator. I, I need to be more active, you know. <laughs> so I, I try to have fun with work. For me, fun is very important. So, uh, yeah, I think, yeah if, yeah, if you see that in my works, that's probably, yeah, that's my, they are very intentional.